I'm often asked about the future of the pharmaceutical industry and the answer is it's uncertain and uh, risky and yet could be highly profitable. So let's tease out some of the paradoxes. Well for a start the top five or six pharmaceutical companies have a research and development budget that uh, is uh, astonishing. In fact it's the size of it's the same size as the entire GDP of around 135 different countries put together. Now you would think with this extraordinary investment that there would be a massive amount of pharmaceutical innovation but sadly that's not the case. If you look at new products coming through pipelines and getting registered and patents and all the rest you will see that around 30% of all new pharmaceutical innovation is happening through these big pharma investments and 70% is happening amongst the 4,000 or so small biotech companies, it's very small innovative organizations often linked to academic institutions who are far and away better equipped in terms of creative thinking and new processes. In contrast the old pharma companies are often segmented by uh, by a rather archaic um, and traditional way of thinking about disease uh, uh, into different therapeutic areas when often it's the same disease mechanisms at the physiological level, at the cellular level that may explain the mechanisms for all kinds of different diseases but traditional pharma companies find it hard to take that kind of wild leap into processes and, and instead uh, are usually consumed with rolling out and yet more look-alike drugs with just almost identical to something they've been selling for years with just one tiny little part added to one molecule that enables them to get a fresh patent and maybe preserve some kind of income stream for the future. And uh, most of the new products which have been coming through for the last five to ten years have been just these add-ons, these relatively boring, um, uh, relatively uncreative, unimaginative solutions to generating income. And pharma companies are also obsessed with the blockbuster. That is a drug which is going to generate at least one billion dollars of sales. That means that loads of people have it. The problem is, is, uh, is, is chronic. They're going to have to take the medicine forever. Uh, no possibility of cure. This is the ideal drug. So drugs for rheumatoid, for instance. Uh, drugs for, um, for, uh, for asthma. All kinds of things like that are wonderful blockbusters because they don't actually deal with the fundamentals of the situation. Drugs which are very difficult for pharmaceutical companies to develop are those that actually deal with an illness and make it history. Um, and that's why antibiotics are a real challenge. Quite, because you only take them for a few days if it's any good. So where's the revenue? And there's a psychological barrier beyond which most governments will not pay, most insurance companies won't pay for, say, 10 tablets of a particular kind of powerful antibiotic therapy. I take antibiotics, there's been hardly any real innovation in antibiotics for the last 30 years. Yes, tinkering around the edges, but we have not seen a fundamental breakthrough as powerful as the, say, the development of, of penicillin or cephalosporins or, 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 or things like that, um, or very few of them. And that's why we are now playing catch up uh, with uh, huge numbers of mutant uh, bacteria which are multiply resistant and really beyond our control. And these will be increasingly disruptive to healthcare systems unless we can find a new generation. But that will require a new effort in terms of funding. It's the same with antivirals actually. We've seen very little progress in antiviral therapy. Yes, we're tinkering around the edges. But we've not seen the kind of breakthrough that we saw in the 1940s with penicillin. We just don't have those kind of technologies. When it comes, it will come from one of the 4,000 small biotechs, most likely, rather than from the big pharma uh, uh, giants. And the pharma giants are also under pressure because of the, uh, the, the generics industry, which snaps around its heels, uh, uh, looking to pump out uh, drugs without uh, paying any license fee. It's a bit like pirating software. And uh, within often the two, three or four years of a drug coming onto market, um, it's been difficult to protect patents in some countries. It's been, uh, uh, there's been quite a lot of moral pressure not to pursue patent protection even when you've got the legal right to do it and the legal strength within that country to do it with things like HIV, uh, with, uh, with, with the basic treatments for things like malaria and other things uh, for, or diseases which affect those in the poorest nations. It's been very, very hard. And so, for instance, with, uh, 
with uh, drugs uh, that are used to treat things like anthrax, which was in the news when the anthrax scares hit New York. Cipro, ciproxicillin. There's two versions of it. They are identical. One is made in India and has been available online for 35 cents a tablet. It's generic. It's a pirate ripoff, if you like, of a patent uh, situation. And the other has been sold on the streets of New York for $5.34 a tablet. That's a $5 a tablet difference. Now you try and justify that kind of price difference to a, um, a subsistence farmer who lives in a mud hut in, uh, outside Nairobi uh, who has a, a total income per year of around $55. You tell him that he's got to pay $5.35 per tablet to save the life of his daughter when he can get a generic uh, version for 34 cents a tablet down in the street and you try and tell him uh, that, uh, that he's going to be locked up in prison and turned into a criminal. In fact, you try and tell his friends that. You try and tell his friends in the UK, in the United States that. It does not go down well. And this is the reason why generics will continue to flood the market in loads of different places and why drug companies will continue to have real problems from the moral and ethical point of view in pursuing what is legally theirs by right. So, innovation problems, creativity problems, not investment problems, there's plenty of money there, getting their return on the investment problems, yes, um, and you've got governments looking for a, a squeeze on uh, pharmaceutical profits. So, the pharmaceutical industry is in for a rough ride and, you know, some pharma companies could lose, potentially, it's a small risk but it could happen, up to 70% of their income within a month or two. It would only require a series of unfortunate deaths, clusters of deaths, which, which, uh, which resulted in the loss of license or the withdrawal of treatment for say two, three or four of the largest were earning drugs. Um, and, uh, and that would be the loss, as I say, of most of their income. So it's uncertain days and yet on the other hand we have an aging populations in many wealthy countries. Uh, we have a situation where, uh, in theory, if you include, include pension pots, 75% of all American wealth is owned by those over the age of 65. Uh, we have a situation where 65% of all health spending in many developed countries is on those over the age of 65. We have a situation in Italy where there will be soon one million people over the age of 90 by 2026. Most of them will be women. Many of them will need uh, multiple therapies. Uh, a very high proportion of those over the age of 70 have two, three or four chronic conditions, each of which requires daily medication. So in theory, the future should be really bright for the pharma industry, but the reality could be troubles ahead.